Um, okay, so the first thing we really ought to talk about here is the, uh, the paper one assignment. Right, so you're going to be doing a 1,000 to 1,500 word argument based on a close reading of a single text, right? So you're doing a focused interpretation of your chosen text that relates to a single important theme or idea. So one thing you might do is like if uh, you have done particularly well on or really interested in an idea that you had when you're reading quizzes, like you, might you might try expanding on something like that. I'm also happy to talk over with you any other ideas that you might have. Um, you're going to do this in two stages. The first is going to be a 250 word proposal, right? Where you're just going to sketch out your basic idea and your working thesis for it. And then the second will be the complete paper. So, <clears throat> any questions so far? Okay, let's talk a little bit about what we want for the proposal, right? So you're going to give me your working thesis and a brief description of what you intend to do to advance this thesis in the long run, right? So for your proposal, keep in mind, you're only describing your argument to me. You're not actually making the case here. So it's just like a thumbnail sketch or a preview of the bigger argument. Here's what it should include. A statement of the question you're trying to answer or the problem you're trying to solve. Your current working thesis, which should be your proposed answer to that question. And the most important background information you think your reader will need to understand the argument, right? And this all in three, 250 to 300 words, right? So keep it brief, keep it tight. Now the reason that I want you to do a proposal before we do the final paper, before we do the actual paper, is to make sure that you have a viable idea before you commit yourself to writing a longer paper about it, right? And to try to work any kinks out of the idea first before you begin the process of your writing the paper. So any questions about the proposal? Okay, so let's talk about the paper. So your first step in writing the paper is going to be to gather evidence, right? And this is something you should be doing in the proposal stage, right? Because your thesis needs to be coming out of the evidence that you are located. So you're going to choose quotes that you think point to some bigger issue or idea in the text and that add up to some kind of meaningful path. You start with close attention to particular words and sentences. Right? So both the literal and implied meaning of words, um, potentially ambiguous words that might have multiple meanings, and potentially meaningful images and symbols. Your next step is to focus on patterns and connections. Look for words, images, or ideas that repeat through the text. Look for lines or words that are connected through things like rhyme or alliteration, or even like if we're looking at a novel like Oliver's Travels, right? You may have noticed some parallel structures between part one and part four, right? There are some striking similarities in the way these two parts of the book are narrated. Think about the sequence of plot elements. And as per a quiz question today also, think about the relationship between the narrator and speaker or the reader or viewer, right? That relationship between author and narrator. And then you're going to want to try to put that pattern together, right? So how do the details you've noticed so far add up to a singular theme? How can you resolve the meanings of ambiguous words? What potentially contradictory ideas does the text hold in contention with each other? And how, is the, how does the way the text is put together help us either to make meaning out of it or prevent us from making meaning out of it? Sometimes we will find that the text is like almost willfully obscure, right? It seems to be trying to get in our way of finding the answer. 
And finally, what's probably the most important thing for me after the close reading is make sure your argument is properly contextualized, right? We spend a lot of time talking about history and theory, right? So try to make use of that. Right, think about the way the text reflects theories of fantasy and science fiction writing we've discussed in class. Think about specific historical and literary, philosophical, and cultural trends that it references. Think about the stance it adopts towards its historical moment. Right? Like is, is the text critical of something in its historical moment? Does it seem to be embracing its historical moment? That sort of thing. Um, and finally, and perhaps most important for me, I promise to hunt down and name anyone who uses phrases like back in the day and in today's society. <laughs> Does anybody know, can anybody uh, anticipate why I hate those phrases? Well, it's, it's vague. Yeah, it's vague. It tells me nothing, right? Um, and it suggests that, it suggests that you think history is a jumble of events that happened before you were born in no particular order and no, with no particular bearing on anything, right? Oh, that's just how things were back then, right? When I think one of the things that we have been noting as we've been looking at these texts is that history is actually a very powerful shaping force on culture, right? So please, please, please do not use the phrases back in the day or in today's society. Now, don't use in today's society because we're not talking about today's society. And don't use back in the day for the reasons that we just saw. Uh, okay. So your proposal is going to be due Monday the 4th. The paper itself is due Wednesday the 13th. So, the, so this is coming up, right? But, you know, I think we've done enough um, to prepare you for it. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about the assignment at all? Yeah, Nick. Uh, the proposal, is that by 1159 or is that by 5? Always by 1150. Yep. And digital. Yeah, digital only. Yeah. Yep, just upload it to Georgia View. And you know, if you can't upload it to Georgia View for some reason, just let me know. Or if like, you know, you get it done at like 1201 and it's not letting you upload it, it's kind of managed to be able to upload it. Yeah, in general, assume 1159 is the as the view. Any other questions? Okay, if you have questions as you work, then you know how to get in touch with me. Um, I do want to note, though, that um, if you are emailing me on, say, like, like, say, 10 p.m. on the day that it's due, you're less likely to get a response, right? Um, so I will, I, you know, I do check email frequently, but you've got to give me time. And you got to make sure that I will at least have, you know, a working day in which to consider your question. Um, okay. So with that, then, um, let's talk about Winans and Yahoo's. What do you think of that, Nick? On the quiz, I just wrote courses, just to make it easier. It's okay? it's okay. How do you properly pronounce Winnings. Winnings. Like a horse whinnying, yeah. Like Quinnings would probably be the most proper uh, pronunciation. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so it, it, there are two possible things that Swift, or actually maybe three possible things that Swift is doing with the name Winnings. On the one hand, yeah, it's an imitation of the whinny of a horse. But it also looks and sounds a little bit like humans. And other scholars, although like I'm not, I'm a little bit less, uh, less keen on this idea. Um, as a kind of stretched out, whinnying form of the word you. Now, Yahoo is also intended to sound 
a little bit like human and a little bit like you. So what's the implication if both of these are meant to sound like human and you? Yeah, that we're supposed to recognize qualities of ourselves in both of these species, right? So there's some connection to humanity here. There's supposed to be some recognition of self here in both of these species. Now, which of them is on the surface, anyway, more admirable? Okay, why the windows? Because they have more comfortable recognized society. They have farming, they have building. Uh -huh. You know, they don't need more of a train, but they also just need sleepless monsters. Okay. Flesh. Uh-huh. Does everybody agree? that at least on a surface level, the Winnings are more admirable. What's wrong with the Yahoo's? Why don't we like the Yahoo's? Why doesn't Gulliver like the Yahoo's? What does Gulliver have against the Yahoo's? They stink. Okay, yeah, they stink. Yeah, there's a lot more shitting in this chapter too, right? This seems to be a thing with Swift, right? There's, a, there's excrement everywhere. In fact, yeah, that is the, the really only cruel or dangerous thing the Yahoo's do, right? They jump up into a tree and start shitting on his head when they feel threatened. What else is bothersome for us about the Yahoo's? Yeah, they, they're basically us, but naked and feral, right? Yeah. And does Gulliver initially recognize any kinship with these creatures? Yeah, does he even, does he even know what they are at first? Let's look here at page 207. Can I get somebody to start reading for us from, at last I beheld several animals in a field. It's kind of near the top middle of the page. Uh, 207, yep. It's near, very near the beginning of chapter one. At last I beheld several animals in a field, and one or two of the same kind sitting in trees. Their shape was very similar in the form, which a little decomposed. Upon the whole, I never beheld in all my travels so disagreeable an animal, 
or one against which I naturally conceive so strongly. Okay, we can stop there, right? Um, I actually, I use, I use this as an exercise in comp two in building a conclusion based on evidence because what the creature really is is obscured from us here, right? Just as it is from God. In what kind of terms does he describe the eye? What do we notice about the pattern of language he uses. Okay, yeah, it's negative, right? For one thing, you know, like he conceives an antipathy for these creatures, right? Like he hates them. What else? Like you got even with like language that is kind of divorced from any kind of feeling. Not like people. Okay. So he's talking about them almost like a zoologist would talk about a new species that they've discovered, right? Um, you remember uh, we talked last time a little bit about Marco Polo. Describing uh, you know a rhinoceros as a unicorn, right? Because he's putting it into a frame of re he's putting an unfamiliar creature into a frame of reference he can understand, right? A familiar frame of reference. Um, Gulliver is doing something maybe a little bit similar here, although in this case the creature is actually familiar, right? But has been defamiliarized by having its clothes and civilization taken. And being covered with its own extra. Yeah, actually. Like, when I read this description of them, all I could think of was uh, Neanderthal. Like how Neanderthals you know, looked, especially. Uh huh. But I, I think it looked like the, what current science tells us, at least what current evolutionary biology tells us, is that I think our picture of the Neander, like the traditional picture of the Neanderthal, is actually probably a man but they were actually probably much more similar to, and well, probably actually interbred with our ancestors. Um, that we are mostly of, you know, what was called, you know, Cro-Magnon stock. But that, uh, yeah, there's also some Neanderthal, there are Neanderthal genes in modern humans as well. Um, but yeah, well, like, I mean, like, I think you're thinking of like the caveman stereotype, right? Yeah. You know, but even they usually wear animal skins and long um, whereas the Yahoo's are just kind of running around naked. And what's their behavior like? What do Yahoo's act like when there isn't a win in to restrain them? What do the Yahoo's act like when there isn't a win in around to frighten them or restrain them? Yeah. Right, they're wild, they're selfish, they're sexually aggressive, right? Have any of you ever heard uh, this term before? In reference in particular to political philosophy. So this is a term that is used by the 17th century political philosopher Thomas Hobbes in a book called Leviathan. Which was first published in 1660 um, in the aftermath of the English Civil War. So Hobbes was alarmed 
by the breakdown in civil institutions and authority occasioned by the Civil War, and argued that human beings without civilization lived in what he called a state of nature. So the state of nature for Hobbes is a state essentially of anarchy where the strongest can impose their will on others um, through brute force or through cleverness and trickery um, <clears throat> or through duplicitous behavior, right? Or just, you know, by a bunch of people ganging up on someone else who has something they want, right? So, you know, for example, um, say, uh, say Dalen has a piece of land, right? And she's stronger than me and has a big kitten stick. So she, as long as she can protect that land in the state of nature, that's hers, right? But if I can, say, trick her into running off a cliff, or, you know, maybe poison her food or something, and, you know, make her sick, weaken her, and kill her off, then I can take it. Now, suppose I'm not strong and clever enough to do it by myself. I can form a confederacy, you know, say with Carrington and Grace and Nick, right, and the four of us can come after her because she can only hit one of us with that hidden stick, right? But then, once we've got her out of the way, there's nothing to stop the four of us from falling out and turning to each other, right? So Hobbes' basic argument was that what you needed for civilization was security. And security came in the form of some kind of powerful force that everyone had to obey. Right? Whether it be a king or some, you know, some form of government body, right? That took an entire responsibility for public security. So that people didn't just go revenging themselves upon each other or taking each other's things, right? So Hobbes famously says that life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. Because everyone is continually subject to violence. And if you are continually try having to defend yourself from other people, then you have no time to develop the rudiments of civilization. Right? You don't have time for agriculture. You don't have time for art, right? You don't have time for mathematics or for construction. Because you're, all, you're, you're always trying to stop other people from killing you. And I think to some extent, this is what we get with the Yahoos, right? What Swift is giving us is human beings in a kind of state of nature taken to its extreme. But there is one external authority that they recognize, right? What is the authority that the Yahoos recognize? Yeah. They obey the winnings, right? At least when one is present. And how do the winnings treat the Yahoos? Yeah. Yeah, the Yahoos pull the sledges that injured Wynnum's traveling, right? They apparently gather food for Wynnum feasts and then are driven away so as not to uh, prove obnoxious to the hosts, right? And yeah, let's. Um, there's a passage I want to look at where. Um, Gulliver is brought into a uh, winning house. Uh, if we look up page 212. Um, 
near the middle of the last full paragraph on that page. Actually, let's just start, start with that, that first full paragraph, because it was the mayor soon after my entrance. Where else are we coming at? So let, let's let's just like particularly like let's look at how the yahoos are being treated here in a winning home. Right? What does this look like to you? Yeah, which I mean, there's often kind of not too much difference there, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're treated like slaves or like livestock. Right, they're given carrion to eat, right? And they're tied up by the neck. So that you know, only their four claws are free to tear at this raw meat. Now, <clears throat> let's continue on here with the next paragraph. So, with the master ordered a sorrel man and one of his servants. Somebody else. <laughs> what chapter is it? It's uh, chapter. It's chapter two. Part four. The master horse ordered a sorrel nag, one of his servants, to untie the largest of these animals and take him into the yard. The beast and I were brought close together, and our countenances diligently compared, both by master and servant. Who thereupon repealed, or, sorry, repeated several times the word Yahoo. My horror and astonishment are not to be described when I observed in this uh, abominable animal a perfect human figure, the face of it indeed was flat and broad, the nose depressed, the lips large, and the mouth wide. But these differences are common to all savage nations, where the lineaments of the continents are distorted by the natives suffering their infants to lie groveling on the earth or by carrying them on their backs, nuzzling with their face against the mother's shoulders. The four feet of the Yahoo differed from my hands in, in nothing else but the length of the nails, the coarseness and brownness of the palms, and the hairiness on the backs. There was the same resemblance between our feet and the same differences, or with the same differences, which I knew very well, though the horses did not, because of my shoes and stockings, the same in every part of our bodies, except as to hairiness and color, which I have not already described, but which I have already described. 
So what is the source of Gulliver's horror? That it looks almost human, but not quite. Yeah. It's like, he looks like this beast. Yeah. That he is recognizing himself in this creature, right? It had to be pointed out to him. But now that it has been, he sees it, right? And is disgusted. So that is an abject Exactly, yes. It's clear to him now that what the Yahoo is, is like him, a human being, though he recognizes some difference in facial features. Now what's interesting here though as well um, is this is a racialized and arguably racist description, right, of a human face. But it's also interesting here, like kind of what Swift attributes to the difference in features there, right? That he doesn't seem to regard it as a natural one. That he regards the Yahoo's face as distorted from groveling on the ground or from being nuzzled against a mother's back, right? So as though this is the result of nurture rather than nature, right? The difference between civilized and, for lack of a better word here, savage, is solely a, a, is solely a case of virtue. Now this actually also does have some kind of historico-cultural Roots. Um, Swift belongs to a class of people whom we call the Anglo-Irish, um, who were culturally dominant in Ireland in the 18th century. Now. Can any of you unpack what Anglo-Irish probably means in terms of, say, Swift's uh, ethnic descent? English and Irish, a mixture of the two. Sort of. More that he is a, a, an Irish person of English descent. Right? So his family is English, but resident in Ireland. He's born in Dublin and uh, lives much of his life in Ireland as a Church of Ireland clergyman. I think I mentioned that last time. Um, and he was particularly concerned about relationships between, relationships between England and Ireland and the way the English often treated the Irish as an unequal subject people. Um, going so far sometimes as to describe um, English tyranny over the Irish as a form of slavery. It's also, I think, interesting to note in this case that you know he says that both the, cle that the, the cleverest, most violent, and most sexually aggressive Yahoos are all the ones with red hair. Also suggesting you know, maybe something close to Irish identity there, right? That, you know, when kept debased, these people are perhaps particularly dangerous. So let's talk a little bit about the Winnings. What's the Winnim Society like? I've done some unpacking of the Yahoo's here. And just exactly why Gulliver finds them so disgusting. 
because he's essentially realized that he is a Yahoo with gloves and pants. What are the Wyndhams like? They don't know. They don't know a lot, like in terms of what we know and what people know. Like they don't know much about his civilization works and their lifestyles and money and corrupts, like power, plus, like all of those things, and love even, you know, just like that. Yeah. Um, Very simple life. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to put it. Yeah, the point in society is considerably simpler than human society. Yep, no word for evil. And where, like, humans, we think how they feel about death, the women, they live to be 70, 75, and uh -huh. they just accept the death as a part of life. Yeah. And I think that, like, we, we can kind of get at some of what's going on there if we think about a couple of, so one of the things that, you know, Grace mentioned, there's no real concept of love, right? Or at least, no real concept of love for other individuals, right? Who do they extend their love and their regard to? Other women that meet those standards. Yeah. Like they even said they they don't just they don't select their uh, mate on love, they select their mate on whether or not they uphold the standards. Yeah, what, what's of what, what, what's good for the species, right? right? And that the children are bred to be industrious. Yeah. Like from Earth. Uh huh. Yeah, so women love, right, is love for all other women, right, without particular partiality for one's own family, right, even, you know, in the way, um, you know, cults and foals are raised, right? Uh, women couples will happily give away one of their cults or foals um, to another family who's lost one, right, and, you know, no one thinks anything of it. What else do we notice about um, the names of women. Are any of the women's given an individual name? Or at the very least, none that Gulliver ever tells us, right? He refers to his master horse. Others he refers to by their color, right? You know, there's the sorrel nag that is the servant that helps him out in the house. Um, you know, um, there also seems to be a sort of caste system based on color of women's, right? We'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, there is a, generally speaking, kind of lack of individuality, right? Even when they differ in their opinions, as we'll get to in a moment, they usually don't differ that broadly. Yeah, I'm not certain the extent to which Swift would have been all that familiar um, with um, Asian cultures in particular. Um, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but I think that what he is playing here is something closer to a kind of philosophical. Right? What is the principle by which all Wynnum's claim to live? People. Yeah, they don't lie, for one thing, right? So they don't even have a word for it. They say, the, you know, you said the thing which is not. They also don't write, right? We'll try to maybe pull that out and unpack it in a minute. Right, they don't write, and, you know, and, the weird thing about the not writing is that it's not because they can't use tools, right? Um, Bolivar demonstrates that, you know, that a woman can thread a needle with their hooves. That they can use their hooves much as humans use their hands. But they do not write. Um, but there is, yeah, one principle that they live by. It starts with an R.
you know, they all live according to reason, right? That is, they regard themselves as the only rational creatures on the island. And so that which is, their definition of reason is also quite specific, right? Reason to them is that which is in accordance with nature and need. So there are certain things that the Yahoos do, right, that strike them as completely irrational. several colors, where the Yahoos are violently fond, and when part of these stones is fixed in the earth, as it sometimes happens, they will dig with their claws for whole days to get them out, then carry them away and hide them by heaps in their kennels, but still looking round with great caution for fear their comrades should find out their treasure. My master said he could never discover the reason of this unnatural appetite or how these stones could be of any use to a young. But now he believed it might proceed from the same principle of avarice, which I described to mankind, that he had once, by way of experiment, privately removed a heap of these stones from the place where one of his yahoos had buried it. Whereupon, the sordid animal, missing his treasure, by his loud lamenting brought the whole herd to the place, there miserably howled, then fell to biting and tearing the rest, began to pine away, would neither eat nor sleep nor work, till he ordered a servant privately to convey the stones into the same hole and hide them as before, which when his Yahoo had found, he presently recovered his spirits and good humor, but took care to remove them to a better hiding place, and hath ever since been a very serviceable brute. So what kind of behavior is being described here? Loss. What's that? Loss. Loss, yeah. But what can't the women understand about the Yahoo's behavior? Why do you value these stones? Yeah. Why do these creatures give a shit about these shiny rocks, right? There doesn't seem to be any economy or system of exchange on this island least of all among the Yahoos, who are just kind of given cast-offs from the winners, right? So what could they possibly value these shiny rocks for? So this is amusing to the women because it's to them contrary to reason, right? They don't need these shiny rocks. So why do they care about them? Um, there's another thing that Yahoo's do that confuses, that confuses him. If you look on page 242, which actually suggests the possibility of higher faculties of mind in the Yahoo's than the Williams give them credit for. If you look on page 242, uh, it's the last full paragraph on the page. My master likewise mentioned another quality which his servants had discovered in several Yahoo's and to him was wholly unaccountable. He said, 
a fancy would sometimes take a yacht to retire into a corner, to lie down and howl and groan and spread away all that came near him, although he were young and fat, wanted neither food nor water. Nor did the servants imagine what could possibly ail him. And the only remedy they found was to set him to hard work, after which he would infallibly come to himself. To this I was silent out of partiality to my own kind, yet I could plainly discover the true seeds of spleen, which only seizeth on the lazy, the luxurious, and the rich, who, if they were, who, if they were forced to undergo the same regimen, would undertake the cure. Now, ignoring Gulliver's little interjection here about you know forcing people who were feeling this to work, what is the what is the sensation that's being described when the Yahoo? just goes off by itself, despite being physically healthy, and will do nothing but lie down and moan. Depression? Yeah. Yahoo's experienced depression, apparently, right? And you know, given the state in which they're kept, who can blame them? But the idea here being, and I think that the remedy for this, that the, the Wynnims prescribe, is also kind of telling, right? What do the Wynnims say needs to be, what must be done for the Yahoo who falls into this state? Put them to work. Put them to work, right? So that they don't have time to think about their condition. Now I'm going to um, apply here another slight bit of theoretical overlay, right? Um, there is. A French anthropologist uh, by the name of Claude Mansou. And I may have spelled his last name incorrectly. Um, I will check on that and make sure that I correct it next time I this letter. But Mansou. Um, has made kind of an extensive s uh, study of slavery and slave cultures. And he says that we tend to understand the lives of slaves in two ways. Right? The first, he calls the condition of slavery. And this is simply the physical, material conditions under which slaves live. Right? Are they treated kindly or unkindly? Are they given enough to eat, or are they starving? Are they given a clean place to sleep, or not? Right? But Mayasu says that this is exactly the wrong thing to focus on, because the more important thing is what he calls the state of slavery. Right? That is both the legal state of being someone else's property and the psychological state that results from that kind of dehumanization. And I think that what this, what this passage suggests is that the depressed Yahoo is on some level that the Winnings can't understand, aware of his state. And again, so the Winnings also, they assume the Yahoos have no language. I think that we can probably think about this in terms of Prospero and Miranda and their first interactions with Caliban, right? Where they claim Caliban had no language and all he did was babble, right? Which, of course, if they don't speak the language, it's going to sound like babbling to them. So the Yahoos don't speak a language that Winnems can understand. Now, I think this is um, one of the things that should uh, cause us to question Gulliver's admiration for the Winnems. Well, what's the Winnem plan for the Yahoos? What do the Winnems ultimately hope to do with the Yahoos? Yep. Exterminate, right? The so Winnem plan for dealing with the Yahoos is genocide. That is where their reason leads them. That these inferior creatures 
are too difficult to keep, too big a menace, and the only real solution is to destroy them. And really, the only difference in the possible solutions is the level of violence involved, right? Right, there is the one representative of the assembly who argues that the women should just go and just, just kill all the Yahoos right now, right? And then what was the other idea that Gulliver's master horse got from Gulliver? Castrating them. Yeah. Sterilize them. And that way they just won't reproduce and they'll die out of a generation or two, right? And they're going to replace them with donkeys. Yeah, replace them with donkeys instead. Now what's interesting with the Wyndhams replacing these human-like creatures with donkeys What's that? Slavery. Yeah, it is slavery. It's, it's even closer to human slavery, right? Because the donkey is much more physically similar to the Wyndham than the Yahoo is, right? The Yahoo looks to us like a human being, right? But not to the Wyndham. To the Wyndham, it looks like an animal. However, the donkey to the women. Yeah, it looks kind of like another horse, right? It's like the caste system based on the like, color of the donkey, but there's also a caste system on if you're a winner or if you're a donkey. Yeah, and donkeys don't seem to be ascribed uh, the same level of intelligence as women, right? So, I think we're again kind of like seeing like this kind of this discourse of the monstrous, right? And what constitutes a monster is again very much a matter of perspective. But to the tiny people of Willowbrook, Gulliver, um, you know, an ordinary six foot tall human being in his own, uh, you know, in his own nation, is monstrous, rendered so by his size, right? And in these instances, or in the instance of the, uh, in the instance of the Yahoo. The Yahoo is rendered monstrous to the Gwyndham by virtue of the difference in shape, right? And of the apparent lack of attention to reason. But what I really want you to think about as you read Frankenstein is Gulliver's response to the Yahoo and how that might be related to Victor Frankenstein's response to his creature, right? And just one more thing to remember with Frankenstein, right? Who is Frankenstein? The creator or the creature? The creator. The creator, yes, not the creature. Or simply the creature. Or the creature. Yeah. Let's be nice about it. Okay, so.